You guys are in for an absolute treat of an episode today. I had the pleasure of interviewing a friend and mentor of mine in the coaching space. His name is Austin Stout. I first became aware of Austin almost 10 years ago, probably more than 10 years ago at this point, on a bodybuilding.com forum looking around for my first coach. He was one of the many times suggested coaches that I had found, and I didn't get the opportunity to work with him at the time, but we were able to converse over different forums, and now it's really cool to have the opportunity to interview him today. Austin has been coaching for over a decade and has helped a vast array of clientele, bodybuilders, gut protocols, hormonal function. I mean, the list goes on and on. This man has so much experience under his belt. In our conversation today, we take a deep dive into his coaching philosophy and how that philosophy has evolved over time and how that has allowed his client relationships to flourish, as well as allowing them to have the greatest results possible. Whether you're a coach yourself or a client wanting to get the most out of your experience, this episode is for you. I'm excited for you to hear this conversation. It was tremendously valuable. Be sure to drop us a like and subscribe to our channel so that we can continue to bring you great episodes just like this one. Grab yourself a snack, sit back, and enjoy this conversation between Austin and I. When it comes to coaching, training, nutrition, cardio, supplementation, gut health, um, hormonal health, all those things are the nuts and bolts to coaching. But those nuts and bolts don't matter a whole lot without a strong foundation between the coach and the client. So my first question for you is, how do you go about establishing a strong foundation with a, a new client? Say you have a new client coming in, what are the things that you're focusing on to build that strong foundation? It's a great question. There's, I think we can kind of like, we can break that up into two different categories of, so a lot of the people listening probably have, you know, some general population lifestyle type clients or competitors or some mixture of both and they both come with <clears throat> they both come with their own set of difficulties yeah right so on the side of on the side of the lifestyle you know client they may have some experience following some type of routine or diet or maybe they've done some fad diets or whatever it is on their own whereas on the on the competitor side, they're they're probably pretty rigid, mm -hmm. right? They come with that rigidity already, which poses difficulties because when you have, I feel when you have that rigidity and that p possible like previous coaching experiences, you're coming in with a lot more kind of preconceived bias, right? Potent potentially, um, you have you know you like doing things a certain way, you're used to doing things a certain way, you maybe have had bad experiences, so you have a lot of even unrecognized kind of trauma from that. Um, you know, you get the person that comes in that's had eight coaches and it's, it's a, it's a wall. Like it's, there's a, there's a barrier to break down there. So I think that <clears throat> when we're doing that initial intake process, the more, the more experience you have, you can kind of point these things out easier and easier. Right. First and foremost, you need to ask the right questions too. So in that intake process, you know, you, you shouldn't just be asking about, you know, do you have lab work? How is your gut health? How much do you sleep? You know, I, I feel that it's probably important to also ask things like maybe about previous coaching experiences or about, do you have any concerns, you know, psychologically, <laughs> do you have any, you know, past, you know, eating disorders or traumas or anything that would potentially come up mm -hmm. during our time together. And so we can, we can see those things. And then my, my policy is essentially I address everything right at the start. I think a mistake that a lot of people make in coaching process is they do see the red flags, but they kind of like, eh, they ignore, I don't want to say ignore them, but they acknowledge them, but they don't address them. And they think that they're just going to come in and lay this nice plan out and that those things aren't going to come into play because they're better than the previous person. That's not the case. So I'm, Part of my feedback at the beginning, you know, when you're delivering that information of this is what I'm about, this is what I offer, pricing, you know, all those things. I also want to point out these other things. Right. <laughs> and these other things are potential obstacles, obstacles or hurdles that might hold us back from excelling. Now, the key to that is to present them from a place of caring, professionalism, and respect. It's not like, hey, you're nuts. <laughs> <laughs> like, 
this is, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to go down that route. I, I really want to reiterate the fact that I really care about your results and I want to make sure that we aren't going to run into problems that are going to hold us back. Mm -hmm. So if we need to talk about this up front, or maybe we're not even a good fit, right. or maybe you're a better fit for someone else or, um, whatever it may be, and there's a number of ways that can go. But I think as long as you, as long as it comes from a place of respect, people are pretty, they're pretty receptive to it most of the time. And so, you know, I had a discussion with a coach the other day and they, they're like, well, what if they, you know, what if they don't want to work with me or what if they, um, feel triggered? I said, the people that are going to feel triggered are going to feel triggered. It, it might not be right now, but it's going to be later. <laughs> it's going to happen in two months. It's going to happen in three months. It's the same type of client that's, you know, that's not going to check in with you or follow the plan and then blame you for their results. Like, right. It's going to, that will surface yeah. at some point. So just don't be afraid to <laughs> go in and weed that out at the beginning because you might be surprised. They may have, they may never really have had someone that cared about them like that. Right. Right. So they're like, wow, you're right. That's, yeah, I, I do feel like those things have held me back, or I do feel like those experiences were deleterious to my results or whatever it was. And so I think that's kind of the basis of our relationship at the beginning is just setting the ground rules. Right. You know? Yeah. And I would say that making sure that the client feels heard, that's a lot of what you were speaking to is yeah. like they went through previous coaching experiences and found themselves in a place where the coach was just kind of either dismissing what they were experiencing or saying that they were trying to fix what they were experiencing in a way that was not actually applicable. And it was kind of like, well, this didn't work and I'm, I'm frustrated by this. And so what are some of the most maybe common hurdles that you run into that are barriers that you need to break down with new clients? Mm. So you brought up something important there. So one of the questions I ask on my intake is, um, have you had any negative previous coaching experiences. Mm. And I'm, and I'll say, if so elaborate, I'm not looking for names. Like right. this isn't a, this isn't like who's doing what, this isn't a drama thing. So I can go on social media. It's, it's purely to find out two things. A, what are other people doing that clients don't like? I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. So if I'm doing that, I need to fix that. Right. So that's one. It's a, it's a learning tool for me potentially. Two is tells me a lot about the person. If, if, they're, if they're giving me this same story over and over again about the previous six coaches they have, I'm like, e common denominator here, right? This maybe is a you problem a little bit more than a coaching issue. I, I understand there's bad coaching, but I find it hard to believe that that many, you know, that many tries, there wasn't somebody in there that could have helped you, you know? So, um, so I think going, going back to that question, I think that the biggest things I see are really, really aren't based on anything that I'm doing. Cause I haven't done anything yet. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like we're just starting. It's more so, it's more so that people are, people only know what they know and they don't know what they don't know. So when they come in, they only, the, their only perception of coaching is what they have either maybe they've never been coached or it's what they've had prior. So I have to separate myself and that's difficult because I can come in and just sit there and, you know, if you're talking myself up, I don't know how effective that is, right? That's not really a route that I like to take. So I think that one advantage that I have is I've been around for a long time. So normally most, you know, most people have probably talked to my other clients and they kind of have a gist of it. It's, it's, it's a great thing when someone comes in and says, Hey, I've been following you for six years. Mm -hmm. They're ready to coach. That person's bought in. Right. I'm not selling anything. I'm just like, you know, here you go. <laughs> let's, yeah. let's, let's rock and roll. But, um, typical, you know, typical hurdles that I see are really, really all revolve around buy into that process. Okay. Um, they, they are either, they are either hesitant to pay for something. And I don't think that's a financial thing. I think it can be, but I think a lot of it is just, they probably been burnt before. Right. Majority of the time. And if you would have asked me that question five years ago, eight years ago, it probably been a different answer because there was a lot less coaches. Right. 
but now you're rarely getting a client that's never had a coach. Well, I also, that could be your experience level as well of just like the first time client never having a coach is probably not jumping directly to work with you. That's fair point. That's a fair point. And that might, that, that might be true, true unless they, unless it's purely referral, right? Right. Unless it's purely referral, you do get the, I love, <laughs> I love the person that I always say, uh, for lack of better terms, the unmolested client, <laughs> right? What a term. Okay. Right? Because that's what it is, <clears throat> right? Yeah. They haven't been, they haven't been influenced. Right. Maybe they're, maybe they're not even on social media that much. Yeah. I'm like, this is, it's like a diamond in the rough. You yeah. know what I mean? Like they don't really have the skills yet, but they're moldable. Right. You, a lot of, you know, when people, when I work with these other coaches and they, they're talking to me about the clients they want and they're saying, well, you know, I want someone with these experiences. I'm like, are you sure? Because I'm going to tell you that they're going to come with more obstacles sometimes. Right. So when we, you know, when we're looking at that, at that buy-in process, again, it kind of goes back to, it really boils down to what their past experiences are. Right. And you have to make sure you let them know that you're not going to repeat those experiences. That might be me having a conversation with them. It might be me just say, Hey, go like, go talk to some of my clients mm -hmm. or here's some testimonials or I don't have anything to hide. Here's a, you know, here's a few people that have been with me a long time. Feel free. Just say, you know, I'm not going to give like personal contacts or anything, but D, you know, send them a DM or something and see what they have to say. Mm -hmm. And, um, hopefully we can kind of calm those fears down a little bit. Right. Right. Um, because once you get that, once you get that buy-in, that's, that's you, the biggest thing. Yeah. I mean, you can really, if you're a good coach, you're, you're fine at right. that point. Yeah. You just have to get them there initially. Yeah. I, I guess one of the questions that comes to mind now is that you work with such an array of clientele where you have your lifestyle clients, you have your more specific health-based clients, you have your clients who are coaches themselves, and then you also have your competitors. And so with all three of those, do you have a, a hurdle to get that buy-in that's most specific to any of those particular clients? So I find I probably have the most difficulty getting buy-in from the competitors. A hundred percent. And it just, again, it just goes back to the fact that they've had a lot of other experiences. So they've done things a certain way and they're kind of set in those ways. And especially I have, the pros for sure. Yeah. You know, or someone, anyone that's has, you know, has had multiple coaches or has had a lot of experience. They, they are a little more resistant sometimes, but I have to, I have to reiterate the fact that you came to me because whatever you were doing previously wasn't working. So let's like, let's break this down logically a little bit, right? Like, why are you here? Right. Are you, were you unhappy with your results? Were you, you know, you, you, why did you seek me out? What did you think that I could do for you that you weren't getting previously or, um, that you were having a hard time with? So you, you came to me for that reason. So you're going to have to you know, trust me there, right? If you don't, then either A, maybe now is not the right time mm -hmm. or B, maybe never is the right time. You know, okay. there's, I think there's definitely, I think that a lot of, especially when you're early in coaching, you kind of have to take whatever you can get. You got, you have to build that momentum and you have to build that roster. You don't have the social proof at that point. But at, when you get to a certain point, you are, you can be more selective. Um, and selectivity is not for me. Selectivity is not like, I only want to work with pros. It's like, I just want to work with people that will buy into the process and just, you know, do what they're supposed to do. Be coachable. That's all that, that's all that matters. I don't care if you're soccer mom, Jill, mm -hmm. that wants to lose 10 pounds. It doesn't make any difference to me. A good client is a good client. I agree a hundred percent. And it's, it's, I think it's challenging for the competitor most specifically because even though it may not have worked in the past, they find comfort in the fact of like, this is what I have done mm -hmm. and wanting to continue to have this, this comfort of, of ac actually knowing instead of trying something that is unknown for them or maybe a little bit more uncomfortable. So when you, and you have to recognize that as a coach, you you don't always want to come in and, and pull a 180 on people. Mm -hmm. So I might see, you know, I might see 
a dozen things that I want to address, but it doesn't mean that I'm going to address all dozen things at right. first. I might, I might have to kind of ease them, ease yeah. them into those changes. It's just like, it's just like functional health. I was like, I see all these things. I have the labs. I have the whatever. I've got, you know, this, 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 and this. I can't just give you protocol, 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 protocol. Chances are it's going to be overwhelming. And frankly, it's going to be too much change, too much change. So we we have to, assuming this isn't a dire situation where it's like a, we have to fix this right now, then we're I'm going to make it take that path of least resistance and like, here's the things I can fix really easily right now. So when you fix those initial steps, they feel a little bit better and they see results. They're like, I like this. Okay. I'm ready for the next thing. So when we meet people in the middle, we have to kind of, we have to scale together. So for example, if we can go to a gen pop client too, when it's a matter of you need to eat protein at every meal and drink water, that's going to get you a certain level of result. Okay. You're like, okay, comfortable with that. We got this much result. Now you need to work with me. We need to both level up together. Now we need to track macros or we need to do the next thing to get more result. So we don't necessarily have to go right in and flip them upside down. And I think that coaches that are also competitors or coaches that work with a lot of competitors are sometimes guilty of that because they think that people are like them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like they're not. <laughs> they're not like you. Yeah. Uh, if they were, then – it would be easy, right. right? If people, if everyone was like me, then they would just do whatever, <laughs> do whatever I wanted them to do. Right. But they're not. Yeah. So I, I don't pretend that people are me. I, and I just assume that if they're newer, that they don't know anything. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, the art of coaching is really in a matter of meeting the client where they're at and then being able to progress with them rather than trying to force them into like, this is the most optimal situation and you need to immediately go from where you're at to this. It's like, that's where a lot of the friction is created and the client gets very either frustrated or confused because it's such a big overhaul. Yeah. And it's, um, not only in your planning, but also your conversations. Mm -hmm. Um, when you have people that do have a lot of those, those past traumas or poor experiences, my, my conversations have to be a little, a little more tame at the beginning. I have some people now that have been with me long enough and we're working through some really heavy stuff. We have, they listen, I, I, whatever I say, they're going to do it. Um, and that might mean really uh, me saying some uncomfortable things to them, right. but I didn't start there. No. Right. I didn't start there. I'm like, Hey, you need to get it together this week. You remember like we, I don't want you to <laughs> lose all this progress that we've been making. Right. But I couldn't do that at the beginning. You know, now I can just kind of drop the hammer on them a little bit and like, listen, let's get it together. Let's stop acting like this. Yeah. Everything's going to be okay. Um, But that took time. Right. Yeah. I mean, it comes from building the foundation that we're speaking to right now. It's like you have to have that in place to be able to have the opportunity of really being 100% honest with them to take that big step or or making the opportunity to drop the hammer, if you will. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It takes, it takes trust. And ideally, like we had, we had talked about previously, I like to try to get as much of that out of the way at the beginning of the process. Yeah. It's very important to make it as, as black and white as possible from the jump so that there's no misinterpretation of whether that be the communication or how things are handled. I had a, I had a uh, consultation call yesterday and the lady that was on the call with me had questions for me, which isn't, I don't think that's like unusual no. necessarily. And one of the questions she had was, what do you expect from me as a client? I'm like, I like that question. Yeah. So let's talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> so I could, you know, that was a really easy way for me to just go in and talk about that. And, um, but most people it's, it's really, they're, it's really the opposite of like, here's what I expect from you as a right. coach. Like, well, this is not, this is a two way street here. Yeah. You know, I can only give you what you give me back. If we're, we're never going to get anywhere if we're fighting every week and there's this really abrasive relationship going on, you're going to be three months into that process. And we've, all we have is friction. You know, we don't, we have not accomplished anything. I think that what I always tell the, the uh, coaches that I work with and mentorship to, as I said, if you, if you are 
having those issues with clients and it's a situation where you have, you know, 10 updates in your inbox and your theirs is first, but you're waiting till last to answer theirs. <laughs> I'm laughing because this is so accurate. <laughs> right. Yeah. Problem's already there. <laughs> so in the longer, the longer that you allow that to go on, the harder that conversation gets. Cause if you're six months in and you haven't addressed it, you're going to blindside them. Right. You're going to dump all this on them and be like, and they're like, what are you talking? Right. What are you talking about? So you can't ignore stuff. No. We've all done it. Oh, yeah. 100%. We've all done it. Yeah. I do it less now. Right. But that's also because I'm just not afraid to, I'm just not afraid of somebody saying no. To yeah. Me. And I think it goes back to what you said about when you're first starting coaching, you're taking who you can work with. And so then you allow for a lot of those things to linger on because it's like, I have, this is the only client I've got and I've got to make it work. And I've got to kind of put up with these different things. As you have more experience, you don't have to put up with those things or you have learned that it's just better to talk about it instead of trying to avoid it. Right. And people, and like I said, I think people are more receptive than most realize. Yes. It. Like I'd said previously, if 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 they're not going to be receptive, they're not going to be receptive. It doesn't matter at what point in the process you're at. There's always there's always going to be someone that has that victim mentality, that has that you know shifting blame of type of personality. Uh, we can deal with it now, or we right. can deal with it later. Yeah, it's it's going to come up at some point. So you can't be afraid to to kind of hold your ground and maintain your standards, whether that's from a whether that's from like an execution perspective or it's from an ethical perspective, you know, a lot of your standards really come down to ethics and, you know, and people will, they'll bend, they'll bend their rules because they don't want to lose clients and that never comes back well on them. Right. And so with, you had talked about, uh, the client reaching out and asking, you know, what the expectations were for her. Could you give a list of things that you, you know, gave to her for those expectations? I, um, I told her two things mainly, and I've, I've actually started probably a couple years ago. I, I literally started putting this into the, uh, the initial plan process. So, you know, when I send out the plan and it has, here's nutrition training, here's how you check in all that stuff, all that fun stuff, normal stuff. I will put a, a subsection at the bottom and say, I expect two main things from the clients to make this as smooth a relationship as possible. One is of course, execution. If there's any issues with your schedule or any issues with um, any obstacles that you have, don't hesitate to let me know. I'm flexible, right? We'll work on it. Two is I need I need to know without a shred of a doubt that you trust me and that you're ready to buy into this process. And if you're not, we either don't start now or we need to talk about why. And we need to solve that problem. And that's a non-negotiable up front. And that's, and that's it. Those are the two things. I like it. Simple. Because, if, because the thing is, if you do both of those, what else is there? Right. Right. Absolutely. You know, low reps is best. High reps is best. Fruit is so it's good. It's terrible. For you. you should lift heavy. High reps. Carbs low are needed. Keto squats are bad for your Squats are great. You for should your squat ass for ass. It's fine. It fits my macros. For idiots. When there are so many mixed messages going around, it's hard to know what you should even do or focus on. But that's exactly where physique development one on one coaching comes in. You might have heard of online coaching or even hired a coach before, but we believe in teaching you the why behind what we do while truly taking your life life into consideration. We want to train, educate, and empower you to reach your goals and help you to stop spinning your wheels and just finally feel good. And hey, we're here to help you look good too. You need you. Your health is your wealth. So join Physique Development and let us be the last coach you ever need. Yeah, makes total sense. So now that we have the foundation, we have expectations in place, let's use a, a client example. And, and I'm, I'm sure that you have clients that come to you like this. You have someone who is wanting to build muscle, lose body fat, improve their hormonal function, improve their, their GI function. They want to do it all at the same time. We both know that is not possible. In that scenario, what do you start with and approach first and improve from the get-go? So I've, I've changed my thoughts on this a little bit over the years because we are in, in the fitness coaching space now. A lot of people are harping on 
foundations, which is important. You know, you need to your stress and your sleep and like all these things. But what, what I think some people fail to realize is sometimes people feel so bad that it's very difficult to buy in and do and execute when you feel that terrible. And they might, and the coach may not know that because maybe they haven't had that experience. Right. Have you ever, have you ever felt so bad that you can't will yourself like you're going to lose your job type of situation because you can't perform cognitively or, you know, you're physically just battered. Mm. It's, it's, I think it's difficult for me to expect huge, you know, huge things from that person if they're in that kind of state. So I might have to, I might have to kind of give someone a little bit of instant, uh, instant gratification to feel better. So there's, there's like these, And we saw this, we saw this a lot, especially in the last year, because there's a lot going on in the industry of like, you shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't over protocol people or you should never protocol people. It's a waste of time. Like that's, you know, it's too much. And I think that you have to realize that there's a time and a place for both. And there is also a, I can also make an argument to say that even if someone's foundation is not solid, that I might have to come in and try to fix some things initially to, to get them feeling good enough to be able to work on the foundational items. It's um, like psychology is a great example of that because when we have, when we have psychological obstacles, anxiety, stress, um, tra- trauma, anything like that, it's two prong. It can be environmental, right? It can be based on their environment and their experiences, but it can also be physiological. Mm-hmm. If you if you're having nothing wrong with, and I I would like to know that is like is there something going on in your life that's maybe triggering this? Is it work, family, job? And if the answer is not really, well, then that's probably a physiological reaction. Like why why are we sitting there in a nice calm environment? And you're not financially stressed. Nothing's going on, but you're having panic attacks. Right. It's not your fault. Yeah. That's physiological. We need to probably try to address that. Right. Initially. Um, because if we don't, then it's going to be difficult to execute everything else. So I think I have to figure out where, where that is coming from. Yeah. If it's just purely a trust issue. Okay. But if it's something where we are, we have some neurochemical imbalances going on, then let's talk about it. Um, cause we see a lot of that. We see a lot of you know, our industry is full of addicts. Yeah. Right. And it can be, they can come from addictive backgrounds, substance abuse, or whatever it might be, or they are here because of their personalities. Like, there's no mistake. Like it's, they're here for a reason. Right. There's a lot of seeking behaviors that go on. So it's stuff we have to point out. Um, we see it to varying degrees, more extreme scenarios, of course, like contest prep and things like everyone's probably ran up their Amazon card and, you know, and prep or bought a bunch <laughs> yeah. of stuff. I always tell the story. I had a guy buy a Porsche and prep one time. Oh, really? And then afterwards he's like, Oh, I just bought a Porsche. Like, what did I, <laughs> I don't know what did I do? You know? Yeah. Uh, clearly he had the money to buy the Porsche, but at the same time he's like, I don't, I don't really know if I really wanted to buy that. <laughs> yeah. You know? So, um, so that's, that's an example where his, where his actual, um, neurochemical state influenced him. Right. You know, even though nothing else in his life was different. Um, and we see that a lot in, we see that a lot in people that have all those, that varying degrees of issues. We can, we can say be calm, but if you don't have any dopamine or serotonin going on, it's kind of difficult. Yeah. You know, it's kind of difficult to feel good. Right. What am I telling you to do? What is, what does it even mean to don't stress? Okay. <laughs> what is that? Yeah. So in, in the pursuit of, of getting them to feel better as quickly as possible of the different categories with, with training, with nutrition, with GI support, with hormonal support, are any of those like your, your fast action? I can, I can tap into this and this is probably going to be the quickest response. Yeah. I think that when we're talking about those kind of specific areas of dysfunction, if you will, uh, GI is probably the biggest just because when we, when we get a lot of dysfunction there, we're having issues with, with detoxification, with, you know, nutrient absorption. Um, we are developing, you know, multiple food sensitivities because our microbiome is kind of like boxed in. Now it's very, it's become less diverse. So, um, 
just the power, just the power of diversifying someone's diet, mm-hmm. showing them that there's, you know, showing them that like you can eat all these different foods and, and how it's going to make them function is a great first step. Um, because once we can start getting, you know, nutrient uptake up, it's like this idea of back, you know, probably f- eight years ago when a lot of people were doing, if it fits your macros. And that was a thing, like, you're not going to have nutrient deficiencies if, as long as you do these things. Which was a very interesting statement to make with that. Which is completely false. <laughs> it's completely false. Like I, I literally have mounds of lab work and data showing it, yeah. right? <laughs> so we know that from a from basic function standpoint that we need, we have these cofactors that we need to function normally. If someone's, you know, if someone's like extremely vitamin D deficient, we got to help. We got to do something about it. Right. Right. If someone's, you know, magnesium deficient or zinc deficient, like we have to, we have to work on these things. So those, a lot of that stuff is easy gaps that we can fill in right at the beginning. That's going to get them feeling a little bit better. Right. Um, And there might be a case too, where we'll insert some, some specific support for, you know, serotonin, dopamine, you know, maybe like some five HTP or some tyrosine or some, some different things to kind of, to kind of expedite that process and bridge that gap um, that will help them feel better because as soon as that client feels better we're hooked we're good right now i can start i can start moving into the other stuff yes the bigger pieces yeah moving a little bit more quickly if you will because i I think that you're moving a little bit slower at the beginning to get that buy-in to get the understanding of like hey this is going to help you Um, even even with the process of of having that foundation those different factors they have to have that tangible feeling of like i'm seeing improvement yeah and you should you should celebrate wins any way that you can the because they're coming to you a lot of the time for cosmetic goals they they may come to you for a a functional goal too. Like I want to feel better, but you know that that's not going to be an instantaneous thing. So if I can point out every update, even if the, even if the feedback is everything looks good, let's continue to do what we're doing. I'm going to try to best of my ability to point out a win every week, Mm -hmm. whatever it is, you did something better or something felt better or this worked better. And that encouragement and that recognition of those small wins along the way will continue to increase by and increase by and increase by and and then eventually um you're locked in yeah well i also find it to be extremely important because a lot of clients don't know all the variables that they're even looking at to celebrate because they may only be aware of like seeing the scale go down okay that's a win i see i added five pounds to my deadlift that was a win and then we're able to come in with the check-ins and be like no no no, you had like six or seven things that were wins and you can really celebrate these and and i think that that really changes overall mentality as well yeah for sure and they sometimes they do notice those things on their own, especially when you're dealing with those functional health cases like, Hey, my skin looks clear. Right. Awesome. Yeah. That means it's working. Yeah. Or, Hey, I'm, I'm noticing that my kind of transit time between meals, I'm getting hungrier a little bit sooner. I'm getting those hunger cues back. I'm not so bloated. I'm like, awesome. Problem's not solved completely, but these are things that are telling us that it's moving in the right direction. So I'm absolutely going to point those out. And and like I, one big one that, uh, I I mean, I work with mostly women and like brightness to their skin from the time that they come to me, because oftentimes when they, they come to work with me, they're overly inflamed and they're beat up energy wise. And that's one of the biggest changes is like the brightness in their skin and the, the less inflammation that's just hanging onto their body. And we can really see that through photos. And that's like a huge victory on the early side of things that gets buy-in pretty quickly. Yeah. A little more vibrance, <laughs> a little bit a little more vibrance. vibrance, maybe a little less bags under yeah. the eyes. You know, everything's <laughs> looking a little more perky. Yeah. Um, maybe they're smiling and they're checking now. Yeah, that's a big one. Hey, I've, it's, it's all good stuff. It's all, it's all a step in the right direction. Yeah. And I, and I don't know that I don't know that even all coaches know to point that stuff out. No, I I wouldn't say so. I don't think that they, I think they're probably pretty fixated on um, quantitative data more so. Quantitative data and and the things that they, I think a lot of coaches can get caught up in, what can I share to get the next client rather than, (laughs) rather than how can I take the best care of this current client? And by taking care of that current client, 
the next client's going to come organically. But too many people are, are caught up in the fact of like, how can I use this client as the marketing for the next? Yeah. So I share, I share a lot of, uh, a lot of those small ones, like in my stories, mm. pretty regular basis, like screenshot something, man, I feel, I feel like I did when I was 18 again. Right. So cosmetically, the result is still not fully developed yet, but someone else is going to see that story. And they're like, man, I, that's awesome. Like I want to, right. They're going to resonate with it. And people, people will resonate with it even more because they probably don't even realize that they're feeling or experiencing those things. A lot of the time, you know, they, we're, we're unlocking all kinds of stuff that they didn't even realize they were feeling or experiencing or doing. We're on autopilot. Yeah. The amount of things that clients are often normalizing that can be improved is much higher than what they realize because they have normalized it. Yeah. And it's, this is normal for me, or this is what, this is how I've always felt. Exactly. This is, this is just what my day to day is going to be for forever. It's just something I've accepted. And then when you're able to present to them of like, no, this doesn't have to be your day to day and we can change this. It's like a light bulb goes off in their head and, and it really unlocks a level of potential that they can uh, succeed in and also just opens their mind to what's, what's possible. There's an interesting this is somewhat related kind of pivoting off of that, but there's an interesting process that I think happens to most people. First is everyone lacks self-awareness. Mm -hmm. Again, they just don't realize what they're feeling or to what degree they're feeling it, or they don't realize what their, how their behaviors are impacting them. So we as coaches are building that self-awareness. We're pointing stuff out. And then once we get that, once we kind of unlock that first piece, the second thing is now they're hyper vigilant about things. Now they're seeing everything. Yeah. So it's like we go way up and we kind of peak and we have to kind of bring them back down to baseline and stabilize again because now, and we see this all the time. This is another thing that we battle as a coach is obsessing about data, obsessing about symptoms, obsessing about everything. It's like every time that they, you know, burp or pass wind, they're like, I have SIBO again. I'm like, <laughs> No, <laughs> yeah. just relax. It's okay. Right. Because we've created this huge, like massive, you know, awareness around all these symptoms. And I think that our industry is really guilty of that too. Yeah. We are driving that. We're driving that so hard right now. Um, so people, well, for one, they don't know what's normal. You have on one side of everything's normal. I'm just, this is just the way I am. Or two, Anytime I feel anything, there's something wrong. Yeah. It's like, all right. We got to, we're going to like bring this back to the middle somewhere and realize that even in a perfectly functioning state, quote unquote, there's going to be days that don't feel great. It's normal physio, you know, physiology. And our society is also kind of ingrained to think that it's not okay to feel bad. Yeah. So we medicate like everyone's given medication. Yeah. Everyone's given, you know, they're given these drugs, these medication, they all need therapy. They all need all these things. And like, it's, it's a hundred percent normal that our physiology has some ebbs and flows in it. And how would we even have perception of normal if we're trying to stay up here all the time, if we're always medicated or seeking behaviors or, you know, using substances, drugs, alcohol, whatever it is, we see it a lot in our we see it so much in fitness now too of people justifying, you know, like recreational drugs for therapeutic things. I'm like, okay, but that gets, <laughs> eventually that gets taken too far, right? Right. Eventually that becomes a crutch. Eventually you are dependent on something and you're not actually sitting in your feelings or, or realizing what you feel because right. you're always medicated. Right. I was medicated yeah. all the time. The uh, I, I think there's a, a a dire need to have a one for one correlation to a lot of these things that people try to create, and it really is something where you're going to experience some of these symptoms, and it doesn't mean exactly that you have SIBO again or whatever the case may be. Um, to come back to more on the topic of just 
addressing gastrointestinal function and maximizing digestion. This is something that you have helped me tremendously understanding from a mentorship standpoint. Um, and I've been, it, it has helped my coaching tremendously and helped my clients tremendously. If, if someone's coming to you needing to address their, their GI tract and, and there's so many you know, avenues that we can take this with nuance. But what is the the first thing that you're really focusing on when it comes to addressing digestion to get them moving in the right direction? And and maybe the the question is better phrased as you don't know if they have anything deeper going on yet. I know from your expertise, symptomatically, as well as just looking at some general things, you may be able to pluck out what it is. But let's say that you don't know and you are trying to get to the bottom. You haven't pulled a GI map. What are, where's, where's your starting point? So we have to figure out, first thing we have to figure out is do we actually have, do we actually have any deep rooted issues or is this purely just a, is this purely just a stress driven issue? So I do think that when a lot of the industry started becoming more inclined to use things like GI maps and testing, that's the first go-to. And the data is great. It's like, it's great to have the data, but if we haven't, we haven't really addressed the root of, of these issues yet. Right. And so we're having, so that's why we're seeing people doing, you know, their sixth SIBO protocol. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so if you come to me and you've done, you know, you've done these things already, whether it's with a coach or you've taken it upon yourself to do your own research and try all this stuff, I'm like, why do you think it's not working? Like, well, I had symptom relief and then I didn't anymore. Okay, but why? Why? What was the what was the the kind of common denominator there that you didn't fix? And so that's what we need to figure out. What is the driver? Really, what is the driver of these issues? Helping people understand why they are there in the first place is the most important part mm -hmm. because history will repeat itself if not. And with, with competitors, it's a little bit different because we're going to screw things up again to some extent. Like when you, even if you're in a perfectly healthy state, when you prep for show, if you're actually getting in contest shape, it's difficult. It gets going to cause some dysfunction, right? You're not going to be in homeostatic state. So for those people, we have to realize, like, you know, trying to find the, basically lesser of two evils there and trying to figure out how we can maintain and not continue to drive dysfunction or how we can quickly reverse things when we're done doing the preps and the fat loss phases. But for general population clients, really sustainability is, is huge, right? Like we don't want to, like, I don't want them to continue to have to do these things over and over again. It's what's, what good does that do for one? Yeah, I might be able to post some quick transformation on the page, the little, you know, the little side profile where their belly's not as bloated. <laughs> and that's cool. Don't get me wrong. Like you should celebrate those things. Yeah. But I would really like to know what is after the after. Yeah. What is life after the after? I would like the client to refer me people 10 years from now right. because they had a great experience and they're still doing well. And that really boils down to me giving them the skills to do well and helping them realize why mm -hmm. they're there in the first place. And so when it comes to, when it comes to GI health, um, I, I think a few main things happen. We know that stress is a huge driver always. It's always a component, no matter what, to some degree. The, I think the other thing that happens too, is that people are, they start to, they start to really box themselves in with their nutrition approaches too, because they'll have some food intolerances. They don't really like I know if I eat broccoli, I feel bad or, or whatever. And so now we have this client, if there's a lot of dysfunction going on, that's coming in, they're eating like four foods. Okay. So that's a problem yeah. also. So helping people understand that our microbiome is very diverse and helping them understand nutrition on a broader scope. So example that I use a lot with people that I, that I speak to and a lot of coaches as well is if we were if we were, you know, five years old and we walked into the supermarket with our parents in the fruit and vegetable section, they would say all this stuff is healthy. We just know that to be true. So why are we, why are we as bodybuilders eating two of those things? Right. Right. So it's, it's always kind of funny to me when I'll, when I'll have like, uh, you know, three or four different fruits in someone's plan. They're like, well, what is that? Like, it's okay. Yeah. It's going to be fine. You're not going to explode if you eat, you know, you eat a 
kiwi or a banana. <laughs> yeah. I promise. It's fascinating to me when people have that mentality around different types of fruit or they've, especially from a bodybuilding standpoint, have been told like they shouldn't be eating much, if any fruit. And then you get to a place where they, they come to you or they come to someone who has a greater understanding of things and um, they present them with more fruit and those different things. And it's like a shell shock to them. They can't believe it. One of the things that, so another coach on my team, Trey, one of the things that him and I have spoke about a lot with each more private conversation is you is utilizing nutrition, leveraging nutrition as much as we can to help people heal mm -hmm. versus just relying on super expensive exactly supplementation protocols. So um, kind of going into like, how can we diversify diets and get micronutrients and, and utilize some basic supplementation and start and get most of it out of the way. If we need to do something more extensive later, that's fine. Uh, but the power of, I mean, the power of food is, is, is huge. Yeah. Much greater than what, what people want to believe because supplementation is just easier. The, um, the power, the power of food and the power of, of stress mitigation are really the two biggest things. And so going, like going away from the food, when we get into the stress mitigation part, they need a, they need a, kind of coming to Jesus moment to, to know actually how they feel. So I've seen a lot of like anecdotally, I've seen a lot of examples where let's say somebody, well, I'll give you, I'll give you a great example. I had, I had a consultation sometime last year and the gal had done everything, anything, everything. She tracked everything. She tested everything. It was any data that you could ever possibly want. It was there. And, um, she worked with a coach prior that was very meticulous about that stuff. And so she just had come to me for a one-off consult and I'm looking at all this and I'm like, I am about to have a panic attack. Just looking at it, looking at this tracking wow. right now. This is like, pfft, there's no way that you're doing this on a daily basis and not having some kind of emotional response to this. Right. She's like, yeah, I know. <laughs> so she had that awareness already. She, she, she said that she was going on vacation. I'm like, you know, I think. I'm just going to, I know you're not going to work with me, but I'm just going to give you, give you like a rough outline. I kind of dwindled this all down to a few things. And I'm like on vacation, eat, I said, eat as many different foods as you can that are local and fresh while you're there. It's variety. Talked about it. Of course, have fun while you're there. Got a cycle. Hadn't had a cycle in like a decade. Wow. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, see, <laughs> there we go. And that's, so that was that kind of like coming to Jesus moment. It's like, holy cow, yeah. that is the power of, of that stress mitigation. Right. And that's, and I mean, that applies to GI, that applies to hormones, that applies to weight loss. Mm hmm applies to everything. Right. And especially when they are coming from a place where they have battled through, I've had digestive issues for a very long time. I've had hormonal issues for a very long time what they're often running into is like, I need more data or more understanding of why this is happening. And then as they get deeper and deeper into the tracking of those different factors, they find that by doing so, they're adding more stress that they're not even being aware of. And then that stress is causing the issue to be even greater. Because everyone's looking for the thing. Exactly. They want to be able to, to put the blame on something. So I get... I get this situation. I, I go, I battle myself about this too. Cause I'm a lot of the time I will get inquiries and someone will be referred to me or they, they have 10 different people like go to Austin, go to Austin. And they come to me and I'm like, I heard you're the guy you have the thing. And I'm like, <laughs> Oh no. <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you, I, th if, if you're looking for, if you're looking for some really crazy elaborate protocol, you might end up being disappointed. <laughs> now that's not to say that I might not know some things that other people don't, but I'm just going to say that I'm probably not going to do what you think I'm going to do. Yes. And so some, you know, sometimes they're disappointed. <laughs> oh, well, but I think that telling, you know, showing them why am I getting success from these people? Why, why is my approach maybe different? And when they come in and they've already tried all these things and I kind of start peeling back those layers and reducing and compartmentalizing and simplifying, it works mm -hmm. nine times out of 10, it works. But at first like, well, that's not exactly what I, what I expected. Yeah. 
I'm like, yeah, because all I have to do is look at your intake form and I can tell right away that all this, you know, all this stuff is just driving your right. stress. Yeah. The, the aspect of, of simplification is often, I, I've, I run into this as well because when they do come with a lot of experience of, of dealing with issues, they, they have a lot of different variables that they're looking at or think they should be looking at and backing off and kind of stripping it down to the bones of like, this is the most important things. And then we can kind of add some of these more specific variables back in if, if need be, but we need to get back down to the basics to make sure that we're a hundred percent on these topics. Yeah, I do. So people like, people like, um, phases, right? Mm, people yeah. like phases or time frames and things like that. So we can, I think we can increase buy-in by maybe naming things, or I don't want to say labeling. I, because when I say labeling, I think labeling starts to create, we start to enable bad behavior sometimes mm. when we label people as sick right. or when we label people as, you know, you are, you are candida or you are SIBO. <laughs> like this is what you are. Right. Not doing that. Um, and that's another thing too, we can talk about, but more so this initial phase is going to be a foundational phase. And I, and if I can get you to lock in and do this for eight weeks, I will be able to see what residual symptoms are left and I will be able to give you a lot more, you know, kind of focused protocol based on that. But we, we need to go through phase one and then we can go to phase two and then we can go to maintenance phase and then we can go to whatever phase. Right. Right. So giving, I think giving people phases and maybe even like tentative timeframes can be helpful. Of course, it's not always that simple, but I think it's a helpful tool using foresight when you speak to people is, is really helpful. You know, something that I do a lot because when you're working through GI issues or hormonal issues, it's kind of monotonous at times. Like once you kind of have the, the nuts and bolts there, it's like you're kind of doing the same things because it happens slowly. So if I have a check-in and everything's going well, instead of just saying, Hey, it looks great. See you next week. Hey, this looks really good. Celebrate a couple wins and then say, if this keeps happening, then next we should be able to do this. Or we're probably, here's kind of what I'm seeing. I think this is where we're going to end up next. People love that. Love that. Love that. Yeah. Right. We're using that foresight. Now, if you haven't coached a lot of people, you might not have right. that skill. It definitely comes with experience. Yet. Yeah. But I try to add as much foresight and potential outcome, talking about potential outcomes as I can. Right. Because there's also a large amount of um, – that increases buy-in. There's also a large amount of um, – when you believe in that and something's going to happen, there's that little bit of placebo-esque right, of course. type of thing. It's like when you, when you tell someone – when you're making a move that's, that's pretty important to that client and you have a lot of doubt in your voice, mm -hmm. it doesn't work well. No. You want to be confident. Exactly. I said, if we do this – probably going to do this. Yeah. Probably going to do this. And like, sweet, cool. Sounds good. Yeah. And you do it in a calm demeanor and you do it. You're not over sensationalizing it. You're not, you're not overly heightened with it. I think that, like I said before, your, um, your attitude, like your attitude as a coach rubs off oh, 100%. on clients. Yeah. Um, we have, we have an issue and I'm, you know, in the industry, like we have issues with, people being overly labeled and overly enabled by the coaches. Um, that's conversations I have a lot with I'm like, Hey, you're going to have to, you know, you're gonna have to change your tone and change your approach with this person because you're the problem right now. Right. You are enabling this person. You're constantly telling them that they have this, 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 and this, like, how do you think, how do you think that you can be anyone different if you can't identify as anyone different? If I always, my, uh, my, my fake client that I always use is SIBO Sally. Okay. It's the one that I always use in all my groups. We talk, it's just kind of like a uh, inside joke now. Yeah. We just say SIBO Sally. She's the one that she's identifies as SIBO Sally forever. Right. Until we can help her visualize as something else. We're healed Sally. We're different Sally. We're new Sally. It's like you can't, and you've seen this in sports. Like you've seen this in sports and a lot of people um, a lot of really successful coaches and things, visualization, mm -hmm. right? And that might seem cheesy or or kind of hippy dippy, but it's, it's but at the end of the day, 
at the end of the day, like if you can't visualize yourself as someone else, you're never going to be someone else. You're never going to be better. Right. And, and, and I know that you can, can resonate with this. I grew up in sports as, as you did as well. And I always think of when I go into check-ins, I'm, I'm sending a, a loom as my response. And I think of it as a situation where it's halftime of a football game and how is my coach presenting himself to get the team rallied to come back in the second half? Like, I want to have that emotion to carry that client forward. And like, if, if I was to come in, if that coach was to come into halftime and be kind of wishy-washy and not knowing what he or she was wanting to do, like it would rub off onto the players and the players would be like, well, I mean, are we going to win? I, I don't know what our game plan is, but if they come in with emotion and clarity, just as we should within our check-ins, the client is going to have much better results. Yep. It's, it's positivity, but it's, it's very calm. Posi- it's calm, posi- it's yeah. calm positivity. It's not, it's not faked, right? It's yeah. not faked. It's not overly hyped. It's not, it's not like this grandiosity about it. It's just, it's just confidence. It's calm and it's positive and they will feel that and they will follow suit. It's, we don't want to be overly, we don't want to over glorify. It's not rah, rah type mentality. Yeah. We don't want to over glorify. We don't want to, um, because I always say what, what goes up must come down. Yeah. You know, I always, um, talk to clients about how, about how being, being calm and stable and not having too much, too much up and down is very important. Like we're talking about those, those seeking behaviors a lot where, you know, one thing, one thing that I see often when we're dealing with those things and people are trying to, they're trying to explore happiness in their life. Like they're trying to find other, I'm encouraging them to find other activities and hobbies and things that are not just gym or mm-hmm. food or whatever it might be. And I have to be careful with that too. Cause then sometimes they're doing everything. It's like, if you ever gone on vacation and then on Monday, you're absolutely just smoked, yeah. right? Because you're completely depleted of dopamine and you're like, Oh my. Yeah. Yeah. Because great. That's a positive. That was a really positive experience. But again, what goes up must come down. Right. Right. So it's, we don't want to live in that. We don't want to live in that heightened state all the time. So encouraging people to be okay with feeling just kind of neutral sometimes is important. Um, the have you ever heard the the uh term like dopamine fasting uh, i've heard of it but yeah yeah i think that it's i think the the actual definition is it comes from some and i could be wrong on this but it comes from some more extreme practices of like you know getting a, like a shaman involved oh, like you know okay. probably some kind of drug experience or something where it's very you're very much you know restricting yourself but we can do these things in micro kind of like micro doses throughout our weeks, something that I encourage a lot of people to do that do have a lot of those seeking behaviors or do really, really, really good week, excited crash, right? Like those types of people Yeah, is I said this week, I intentionally want you to say no to three things that you want to do. Mm-hmm. That's it. And it doesn't need to be big. It's not like say no to uh, going to the gym. It's like say no to buying this thing that's in your Amazon cart that you absolutely know you don't need. Yeah. Uh, One big one for me is like, stop passing the thing that you keep ignoring to get done. Like you, you pass it in your house of this laundry hamper that just needs these clothes need to be put away. Like tell yourself, no, that you can keep walking past this, like just get it done. Right. And those small things people really realize how much they're weighing on them after they get the thing done. It was like, Oh my gosh, I feel like 10 pounds lifted off my shoulders just from getting this thing done that I've continued to pass for two weeks. Cause it's not that big a deal, but it is still bothering me and I'm aware of it. And it's like, tell yourself no in that scenario and just get the job done. Yep. Because those micro, those like micro stressors, micro stressors, cause everything's micro stressors really. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, not everyone's life is in complete shambles. It's not like the the really big events are far and few between. Mm-hmm. It's all, it's the, um, the water dripping, exactly. the water dripping on your forehead or the example we used in one of the groups was, um, it's like, if you get a needle punk, you know, get a needle wound in your back, you're going to be fine. But if you eventually there's gonna be a hole. Yeah. And I think this became more present when people started to work from home more 
because then those micro stressors were not only bothering them when they're at home, but now they're home all the time. So then they're just present 24 seven. They're seeing these small things around the house that need to get done alongside the stress of what they have going on within their work. And so then it just became much more prevalent. Sure. And maybe it's, maybe it's even a case of delegating stuff out or oh, allocating resources toward things that are more useful. Yeah. You know, I think that we probably, I don't even think, I mean, I know that a lot of people waste, <laughs> you know, waste so much mental energy oh, on stuff that doesn't matter. I mean, sometimes it's as simple as just like, huh, unfollow this person on social media. Like stop sending me these reels of this. It's clearly giving you some kind of emotional response. Right. What do you, what purpose does that serve <laughs> for you? Yeah. You know, are you sick and tired of your glutes not growing? turning around in the mirror and seeing a board for a booty. I've been coaching for nearly a decade, helping thousands of women reach their goals. The most common goal, grow my glutes. Women in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and even 60s, able to grow their glutes with the guidance of my training programs. And for all this time, I've kept my best glute growth secrets only for my one-on-one -on -one clients. And that changes today. We just released our 12-week glute growth program in the PD training app. It is a four-day program with exercise and volume adjustments every three weeks. You can easily access the program through our app and track every single workout. Each exercise will have a detailed video teaching you exactly how to perform each and every movement. And guess what? I am no longer gatekeeping. I'm sharing every single one of my best glute growth secrets inside this program because you are awesome and I want you to have this program. I'm going to give you $25 off, making it a fraction of what you spent at Starbucks this past month. Use code POD. The link to purchase will be in the description. Now let's get back to the show. I, I, one question I did have for you from an emotional standpoint, as you're going through check-ins, because I know you have a, a number of check-ins on the same day and the, the cases vary and the emotion of each client varies. How do you go about not carrying the emotion from the last check-in into the next check-in and, and so on? that is a that is a great question i would i would love to sit here and say that it nothing affects me <laughs> oh, yeah. but that's not true, <laughs> that's, not true. Yeah. that's definitely not true i think if you care about anyone then it's stuff's tough. gonna affect you to yeah. some point first one is you have to learn not to take things personally mm -hmm. that's huge and that takes time and if you came into coaching for the right reasons which is you genuinely care about people and you want people to get results you're gonna care and you're gonna take stuff personally and stuff's going to hurt your feelings. Yeah. It's just going to happen. It's so hard. It's so tough. You get better at it. I think you do get better at it over time. Um, now, from going you, – so you you bring up a great point because I, I do have a really – I think that my day-to-day -day interactions are interesting because I'm literally all over the spectrum. Yeah. I can go from yesterday. So yesterday I had – First, first check-in was more of a functional health case, pretty intensive GI case. Second check-in was 300 pound bodybuilder. Oh gosh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, Tough. Whoo, polar opposites. <laughs> yeah. Right. So yeah, you do have to, you do have to kind of reshift your focus and your mindset. But, but I think a lot of that again, goes back to me setting up, me setting up the foundation right from the beginning and setting up the expectations right from the beginning of that process. So when you do a check-in, for example, if if you're a coach and you're checking in with people and you're finding that it's taking you 15 back and forths all day long, you're doing something wrong. Right. You're doing 100%. something wrong. Yeah. You're either your check-in process is just not that good. You know, you're like it's maybe not thorough mm -hmm. or you're maybe the verbiage of your questions isn't good. You know, you need to make some corrections there. Maybe you have those people that are really big over sharers. Right. Right. So you maybe need to change the way that you're delivering your, your questions. And a lot of that will eliminate those things. And also using that. I, I think having done it so many times that when I go in and I can see the concerns in the check-in, I just preemptively say all the stuff that I think they're going to want to know. Yeah. I'm like probably going to ask me these questions anyhow. <laughs> yeah. If I don't say them, yeah. I'm going to save myself some time. I'm going to save them some, you know, some stress. And I'm just going to say all that stuff. If they don't use it, cool. If they do great. Yeah. And we can all, you know, we can all move on with our day. Yeah. Um, but getting, getting into that mode of check-ins is, 
is really important. It's, um, you know, it's like a lot of the coaches that I work with that are newer. We, I try to encourage them to check in, uh, set their check-ins up and set their, their time up and allocate their time in a way that they can really be focused and in the zone and work through things. When you have five clients, you can just do whatever you want exactly. and you can just like BS with people all day long yeah. and you just can't when you have 50 clients, <laughs> yeah. like you have to be a little more structured. And then, so if they set those precedents too early mm -hmm. in the process, then they, as they scale, they have a hard it's time. Yeah. They have a really difficult time. Uh, and that's, we're actually doing a seminar in, in June and I decided that I'm, I don't want to talk about functional health at the seminar because I've just beat it to death. So I'm going to literally talk about like coaching preparedness. Yeah, that's a good idea. And all these things that people are not prepared for because they think you think when you come in that you need to learn the information and the protocols and all that, and you do. But what the stuff that people don't realize is that human element, and nobody has boundaries, and nobody. <laughs> yeah, it's like all those other things that are going to make your job so difficult. Yeah, learning how to communicate, ask the right questions, get the answer that you're actually looking for in terms of the depth of answer, is the thing that I think a lot of early coaches run into of just like thinking that it, it's going to be so cut and dry. And it's just not like that because more often than not, the person that you're working with and part of the reason that they're there is that they don't know what is going on that needs to be fixed. And so being able to ask the right questions, um, is huge. And I will say from an emotional standpoint for myself, I have kind of this like reset variable. If I'm going through the check-in and I'm growing more and more frustrated with what the person is saying of like, quit complaining. I, I can't take you complaining one more moment. Yeah. I have to take it. I scoot back from my, my desk and I'm like, okay, what's going on with me before I get into this check-in? Cause I do not want to take this energy into mm. the check-in response. And so it's like, do I need to eat? Do I need to go train? Do I need to get some more water? Do I need to go on a walk and just take some time away from the check-ins? I have to go through that checklist because it's like, you have those ebbs and flows to the check-ins and it depends on what energy that person brings to the check-in as well of like, what's their personality? And like, you have to understand, is this person just more of a, a whiny, complainy person? Like that's part of their personality. I have to take that into context. It's not directly on me because early on in my coaching, I just took everything so personal as you talked about of like, okay, this is all my fault. I need to fix everything. And this is my issue to deal with. And that is so much from an emotional standpoint to take on from a coaching perspective. Yeah. It's, um, you realize you realize that they probably are like that all day to everyone. <laughs> it's <laughs> not like, you. Yeah. It's it probably has nothing to do with no. you. There's and there's a lot of little things. There's a lot of little things uh, setup wise as far as how we do check ins. We had a great discussion in a group the other day. We took like the last thirty minutes of the call and we just talked about biofeedback mm -hmm. and how to set up. Really, just kind of navigating under sharers, over sharers, emotions, all that stuff. So there can be a number of things. Realizing what people are attached to is super important. If they're attached to, a lot of people can be attached to quantitative data: their blood glucose, their scale, their photos. Like photos aren't really quantitative, but they're visual. Right. So I think that if you, so for example, if you get a check in on a Monday morning, and they are dreading going to work, you're going to get heavy Monday morning bias vibes. Oh yeah. And your check-in, even though the last four days might've been great, they're going to give you Monday morning attitude mm -hmm. in the check-in. So maybe you need to change the day. I don't know. Or maybe they're, maybe they're always, maybe there's always like two things in their check-in that they're always complaining about. Maybe you need to restructure how you ask that question or don't ask that question or change when you ask that question. So like I had encouraged some people to, with some of their check-ins where people were really, really hyper-focused on like weight and photos. I said, if you need that data, tell them that the night before their check-in, they have to fill out their whole check-in. Then in the morning, they have to take their pictures and their weight and then they send it mm -hmm. because now I've just detached, I've detached all bias there. Now, granted, they could go back and change their check-in, right? but I'm ass assuming that they're not doing that. Yeah. At least now I'm getting accurate feedback with accurate representation of how they look and their weights and their whatever. Yeah. And so it separates, it separates those two things or heck even having people, I've even had some people where, yeah, they check in once per week, but I said midweek, I want you to, I want you to write 
a check-in. And then on your check-in morning, I want you to evaluate that and see how you feel in comparison to that check-in. So you're not just biasing one thing or another. You're still sending one check-in, but you're not biasing you know, one part of the week versus another one day or one emotion. Yeah. And that's a gold nugget for people to really pick up on of like, allow for some variability within when they're taking the photos and when they're filling up the check-in, if you feel like they are impacting one another. Another one that I would bring to everyone's attention is that uh, for a client who's maybe checking in midweek and they don't have a ton of time in the morning and they get kind of down on themselves because they're having to rush through the photos in the morning, move the check-in photos, like have them take the photos on Saturday or Sunday when they are able to sleep a little bit longer. They've got more natural sunlight. They're a little bit more calm. They're not as rushed because by having that photo, it just comes from a place of better possibility of being positive. Mm -hmm. And so then they take the photo on Sunday and then they're able to send their full check-in on Tuesday. They're happy with the photos that they took on Sunday relative to, oh my gosh, I was running late for work and I had to take these photos really fast and it's dark. The ring light isn't as good. Like it's a much better setup for them to come in with a more positive and even keeled approach to filling out their check-in. And I find that to be tremendously helpful. For sure. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Um, all right. The last question I've got for you today is uh, of all the topics that we've talked about, is there anything that you have changed your mind on recently, or are there things that you're in the process of like, I feel like I can refine my understanding or how I'm going about my particular approach to this X topic. So I, I am constantly refining. (laughs) I'm, I'm always, I'm always making little revisions. I probably, Every, you know, three to six months, I might actually go in and change wording on something or change the way that I deliver something. A lot of it, a lot of it's just pattern recognition. You know, if I'm seeing these, if I'm constantly seeing this same problem over and over and over and over again, maybe I can do something better on my end with the way that I collect data or the way that I ask questions or the way that I present a protocol or something like that. So maybe it's not one specific thing, but I do think that if you're a coach, you should either a make mental note of it or have like a scratch pad or something where you can, you can realize like every single person or 50% of my clients have this issue. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm constantly having to reiterate this thing or they, they do, they dislike this question Maybe you should change something. Maybe you should adjust something with your your approach mm-hmm. rather than you getting mad that they're not doing it. Right. Right. Because one person, one person's one thing. But if this is like a repetitive, if this is a repetitive thing where you're seeing it across the board with the majority of your clients, maybe it's maybe it's you. Right. Maybe there's something you need to fix in your approach and you can you can save yourself a lot of stress. You can save your clients a lot of stress and kind of expedite that process. As far as like actual technical things, man, I would say that I would say that I probably use, I probably use testing like specific testing, you know, your GI maps and your Dutch tests and blood work and stuff a lot, a lot less initially, right? Like right out of the gate. I use them a lot, but not always right off the bat. Yeah. If, if they have the data, great. If I feel like I absolutely need it. Okay. But there's just, you just come to realize that there's just so many things that have nothing to do with blood work that you have to work on. That's like, it's kind of a moot point, right? It's, it's few and far between the client who's going to come to you that has all the things figured out to where jumping immediately to blood work or immediately to a GI or a Dutch. It's like, 100% necessary, right? Like there's just a lot of things that we can address right off the bat. Um, I guess I have one more question. Is there anything that you're specifically studying at the moment to, to strengthen your coaching? Is there something that you're focusing on right now and expanding your knowledge on? I get asked that a lot. I think people ask how I educate myself. Uh Well, the main, the main way I educate myself is I get 
a ridiculous amount of case exposure. Yeah, your, your case like, exposure is through the roof. It's, so it's like insane. Yeah. The amount of the amount of blood work and cases and Dutch tests and GI maps. I couldn't even tell you how many I'm probably seeing double digits of those easily. A, I mean, a week. If I if I get a, a GI or I get a Dutch, I, you're one of my reference points. So you're seeing not only your cases, but I, I'm, I know that I'm also not the only person who's touching base with you as a mentor. So it's like, you're getting, like you said, double digits easy. It's ridiculous amount of case exposure. Yeah. So just, just getting that, that repetition and that pattern recognition is probably my, that's my main source of education. Of course. Plus you guys all have different perspectives. I work with, I work with beginner coaches, but I work with a lot of advanced coaches too. So I respect all the things they have to say and there. I realize that they may do something a little different that still works. So I learn you know, I learn little things or modify little things that way. And I think the second thing is I'm, I'm trying to tap, I'm trying to tap more into the, like I said, that simplicity process, how much can I do with very little? Right. Right. Because again, and this really just ties into the first one is you realize over time that, well, one, things are very expensive, mm -hmm. expecting someone to you know, run five hundred dollars with the supplements a month, and this four hundred dollar test, two or three of those, and pay for the coaching and and stuff. Like it's it's, it's a lot. It's a lot of money. So, like, how can I how can I do the most with the least? Yeah, and then utilize those tools sparingly as we go. And it's people are people are just generally amazed when they can see like, man, this really isn't that difficult of a process. And I think that comes with, with the experience and, and having the real knowledge, because oftentimes when coaches are starting out, they're trying to establish, like, I am the expert, I have the tools for you to succeed. And so then they often either over, um, put supplements into protocols or they over test because they're trying to be like, look at all these fancy tools and things that I know how to read or I know how to utilize for you to have success. And I think that as you continue to have more experience, you're able to kind of pull back the layers and say, I want to go with a more simplistic approach because we can get more out of less. I say less. I say with like our SIBO Sally sample, I use, I use less labels mm. all the time. Yeah. You know, I'm like, that calm, that calm demeanor. Sometimes you, I get some labs. I'm like, oh my lord! <laughs> yeah. But I'm not going to say that to them, <laughs> right? You know, I'm going to, I'm create a little bit of sense of urgency in there. But at the same time, I'm not going to be like, yep, you're screwed. Yeah, this is like, not panic. Mode. This is like the worst. <laughs> this is the worst thing I've seen so far this week. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's not going to be that effective. Yeah, yeah. So definitely opening up there is not the place. Maybe after you've got it solved, you can say, you know what? This is one of the more complex cases I've seen in a while. And I'm glad that we got through it. And these were the more challenging pieces. And I'm proud of you for working through it and so on and so forth. Yeah, because you get because a lot of people think they are the most. Mm -hmm. I've had all the you know, I've, I've worked with these coaches and I've not had success and I've studied all these things. I've done all this stuff. I am just the most complex thing you've ever seen. I said, for one, you're probably not. I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and two is even if you were, I'm not going to. I'm not going to present it to you. No, way. no, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for coming on. We will have all of Austin's information in the show notes. We appreciate you guys watching. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure that you like this video, subscribe to the channel, leave us a comment of the favorite thing that, that Austin brought up, and we'll see you in the next episode.